Welcome to Discovering. Tonight we'll take a look at a UP garden with a nine month growing season. On average, I can grow about nine to nine and a half months per year. Then we'll check back in to see how restoration is coming along on Craig's 100 year old wooden canoe. And some insight into what's causing this year's overwhelming mosquito infestation. We've had lots and lots of calls about mosquitoes this year, especially in relation to bats. That's all tonight. Put your feet up, it's time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf. Lonesome trill, the eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. If you're like most gardeners across the UP, the garden looks pretty much like this right now. Our growing season starts late and ends early. Gardening is by no means easy. It usually involves a great deal of time spent on your knees planting seeds and pulling weeds. For some, that's just not possible. I met up with a Marquette artist and inventor who has a plan that will make gardening accessible to everyone, extend the growing season, and create employment here in the UP. This is uh, the first Boomer Bloomer prototype. And the reason I came up with the Boomer Bloomer is obviously it was catering to the, the baby boomer market. As the baby boomers get older and older, they're starting to develop um, bad backs, bad knees, they've got arthritis and stuff. So that's where I'm heading, creating products that satisfy that market. Um, June 12th, that's the last frost day for our zone. That means that's the first day that you can plant your seeds. Now with the Boomer Bloomer, it's got a lot of electronics in it and everything else. This is the very first prototype. It's been around for five years and this shows you how far ahead I am of the game. All right, this is the full scale Boomer Bloomer model. Now this is 32 square feet. The Boomer Bloomer is a seasonally heated raised bed, not in the sense of a raised bed because most raised beds are just beds that are off the ground. This one is entirely off the ground on a stand. This is actually a floating garden. So it was designed for um, people who had bad backs and bad knees so that they can um, garden from either a standing position or from a wheelchair. Most of the stuff in here is really easy to do. It's just simply put water in the trough and we'll show you that on, in this in a minute. You can start um, usually about three months earlier than normal. Now the lady that owns this garden just told us that she didn't plant this section here because there was so much snow here, she couldn't get to it. What I recommend is a staggered start in your gardening, your planting schedule, so that when these are pretty close to being done and they're ready to bolt or go to seed, then you've got other places that you have staggered starts where they're just starting to come up. So you always have a fresh garden working all the time. Now, on average, I can grow about nine to nine and a half months per year. Now our normal growing season is three months, three and a half months at best. So this stretches it out quite a bit. Now you see this little controller here. This is what controls the temperature of the garden. And underneath here is the sensor unit, about three inches down. That indicates when this controller is supposed to go on. So whatever I set this temperature at here, let's say 85 degrees is the optimum temperature for germinating. I don't care where you plunge your thermometer, it's going to be 85 degrees, three inches down. You have total control of the greenhouse. There are a 
number of layers of soil under here. There are um, actually, there's pea gravel at the bottom of this. Then you got a sand layer in, in above that. And then there's a layer of clay mixed with regular soil. And what that does is it traps more moisture, a layer of compost, and then your growing medium. Ventilation's really important in a greenhouse. Uh, I've got arrow, what I call arrowhead vents here. How much you pull the arrowhead down um, from the top will open up the ventilation capability a little bit more. And then you couple that to how, uh, how much open you want your uh, lid to be. Now the lid is sealed. There's a, a pressure seal right here. It's called a D-seal. And when that comes down here, the air can't get in here. And so all that heat stays trapped inside. And then this has a uh, layer inside and on the outside. So that double layer allows me to go a little bit lower in the temperature. This one I can go comfortably down to 18 degrees. And the, the beauty of having the two layers in here is if the leaf of the plant touches the inside of this, because of that dead air space, that plant tip is not going to freeze by touching that cold plastic. Okay, here's the watering trough, and this is how you do the watering. You just basically pour water in here, and um, what it'll do, it'll go down underground through these openings here. There's tubes that connect on, and they go into the grid that contains the electronic system and the watering system. And the reason for the watering system is that it has to be close to the electronic system in that soil because the moisture is very important for it to be able to transfer heat. So basically pour water in here, eventually it'll just work its way down and the entire garden gets uh, water dispensed equally. Because I've uh, drilled the holes in the dispensing tubes and everything else underneath here so that friction, it allows for friction. So it'll dispense the same amount of water at that end as it does on this end. Now there's a reserve on the bottom here that allows water to sit there. So that's always drawing from the underside and working its way up into the soil. And then um, if you water it from the top, what happens is that compacts your soil right away. And that's why we water from underneath. You cannot possibly overwater in a boomer bloomer. You just keep putting water in there and it'll work its way up just the amount it needs. And that's it. Now um, the cover material is very important. You don't want real clarity in your cover material because that makes plants want to grow towards the sun and they become tall and spindly. It's why you don't see glass greenhouses anymore. This is a good material for that. It fractionates the light, it creates dispersion of light, and that makes your plants grow bushier. Now this is called uh, Grifflin TX1600. I get it from Reef Industries out of Texas. And uh, it's a beautiful material. Um, it's a high density polyethylene with UV inhibitors in it, so it doesn't degrade in the sunlight. And then sandwiched in between this are these polyester strands, which don't degrade in sunlight. So it's really a strong material. It's about a 10 mil thickness. If I want to reach the center of the garden, I only have to reach about 24 to 26 inches. And the person in a wheelchair can do that. I've checked the arm reach of a number of people that are in wheelchairs and it, and it seems to uh, work pretty easy for them. Now here's the reason why is it has loose pin hinges so if I pull the hinges on this side then the canopy hinges on the other side and then vice versa if I put the hinge back in here pull the hinge on that side it'll be the this will be the hinge side and you can lift the canopy on the other way and then this prop bar is what holds it all up. Now the reason why I designed this product is not because I want to get into gardening uh, or, or sell greenhouses or anything like that. The whole point of making this thing was that years ago when I had a manufacturing facility, I uh, set up a cottage industry where people could do sewing in their homes of the products that I was selling to Cabela's and Gander Mountain and uh, Menards and places like that. 40% of my sewing was done in the Marquette area in people's homes. Why can I do that with woodworking and sewing again? If somebody can do the woodworking on the end wall frames, somebody can do the sewing, and then somebody has the wherewithal to do the assembly and delivery, those people have employment to serve their local communities. Uh, we need your feedback. 
And so any kind of feedback you can come with us. If we have the positive feedback and we know that the products are marketable, then we can start working towards the avenue of creating employment to uh, solve that need. A while back, we saw the beginning of the restoration process of this 100-year-old wooden canoe. I checked back in to see how things were coming along. Uh, where the canoe's at right now is it's ready to be varnished, and we've got all of the components, a lot of the components that go with the canoe that we'll be preparing as um, we continue with the restoration. This is a floorboard that came in the canoe. It runs the whole length of the, the bottom of the canoe, and this is the color that the inside of the canoe was when I got it, and it all had to be stripped off. Gives you an idea of just how thick the, the finish was on the inside of the boat. And you can see there's a couple splices in it, and those can be fiberglass so we can keep the original floorboard in it. And there's a hole here, and that's where the mast step goes, where the, the sailing mast is. This is called the cap rail, and these cover the top and the side of the, the shear line of the canoe. This is one of the, the things that is kind of unique to, to be in Morris. It really gives the boat a real finished look. These are the dagger boards here. Again, these dagger boards are around 100 years old, so they're showing some wear in them. The canoe seat here will have a hole drilled in it. The mast will go down through the hole in the seat. That's how the mast sets into the canoe. The thwarts have already been cleaned and varnished. They need another coat of varnish on them yet, but nice mahogany thwarts. Okay, the rudder fastens onto the back of the canoe, like so. And then there's lines on this, and that's how you steer the canoe, is with the lines from the inside the cockpit. There's a, a metal things that come off the, um, the back of the canoe that these set into. This is the original seat that came in it, and it has a very unusual um, caning to the to the seat. The book that I have on caning calls it a spider webbing. With Morris canoes, originally a lot of them were um, stained the mahogany color so that the inside of the boat and the inside of the boat matched the mahogany gunnels and um, thwarts and and decks and seat frames and but we have the choice <laughs> of not doing that if you like Craig likes the natural color on the inside and a lot of the original Morris boats were left natural but it was the buyers decision to do that if they got them straight from the factory they came with the inside stained it was called pigeon blood but that was just the color the mahogany color. There's a couple different things that the varnish does. It also um, uh, protects the wood from the harshness of the sun. So that's one important quality about the varnish. But you do um, smooth it down between coats. Yeah. It's like refinishing furniture. You... The first one is kind of a, a no-brainer because you see it gets sucked into the wood. So you know that it's going to need more than one coat but then you'll see it uh, start to build up and then it, it, it has a, a, a richness to the finish when you see that the wood grain is completely filled up. You just kind of keep going until you say, ah, that looks nice. The canoe builders had an eye to making their canoes artistically beautiful, not just functional. And of course, these canoes are based on what the Native Americans did which also involved putting designs into the bark. And it's been an, uh, a mode of artistic expression from the beginning. So we're just carrying it on. And that's why it's good to, um, to let your own artistic expression come forth. The ribs on a Morris canoe are tapered. They're thicker here, and then they go up and become narrower. And that's pretty typical of a canoe built in Maine. There's a lot of finesse in just the ribs on a canoe like this. And it's one reason that people are attracted to the old canoes and because you appreciate the finesse in the woodworking. I counted up the number of Morris canoes in our database just yesterday 
and there were 305. And we know that there were um, more than 20,000 that were built between 1891 and 1920. A little over 300 have come out of the woodwork and there are probably at least that many in barns and boathouses. And one of the types of canoe that the Morris factory workers made at Old Town, they had been making um, a cording canoe that was used on Belle Isle in Detroit. In that time, a young man used a canoe to impress his lady, so if the livery had really pretty canoes, they would get the business of these young men who were trying to impress the ladies. It's amusing because they'd have those Victrolas with morning glory horns and tons of pillows, and the lady would just sit and recline against a backrest, and the gentleman would paddle wearing his straw hat and tie and white shirt. But some of the workmanship of some of the older canoes, especially the cording canoes, um, you can't beat the workmanship. I think it's too expensive now to do the quality workmanship that used to be done on some of these old canoes. For an example of that, here's the caning here and um, how elaborate that was and how long it probably took somebody to do that. I fell in love with wooden canoes. Well, I'd go to this outfitter place and, and look at these canoes that were for sale for $5,000 and think, oh, I'm never gonna be able to save that up. And um, I had no idea that you can get an old canoe for just a few hundred dollars and work on it yourself or work on it, you know, find somebody. Because a lot of the people who restore canoes today will let you come into their shop with your canoe and they will work alongside you and it's not gonna cost you an arm and a leg. Um, and then you have some of yourself into this canoe. And it's, um, it's a wonderful thing. A wooden canoe is absolutely quiet in the water and you, you feel like you're more one with whatever the wildlife is there. You're not gonna scare them away. And, um, and that's, and I wanted one. But as I said, it, it just, I didn't realize that I could go and find an old one and fix it up and do that cheaply and have a wonderful wooden canoe for less than I would pay for a new non-wooden canoe. You know, we're doing a, um, what I think is a pretty unique canoe here. But if people are interested um, in looking at more canoes and seeing a different type of canoe, going on to the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association website. There's people that collect like the cording canoes and stuff like that. You can get to see some pretty interesting canoes that are just not a normal everyday canoe. We'll be checking back in with Craig and following the progress right up till the time the canoe is once again joined with the water. Living in the UP, that's a song we're all too familiar with. They've been around for 30 million years. They can sense carbon dioxide and lactic acid from 100 feet away. They can locate their target through heat detection. They can visually zero in on anything that moves, particularly if it contrasts with its background. I talked with DNR wildlife biologist Bill Scullin to get to the bottom of this year's overwhelming mosquito infestation. We've had lots and lots of calls about mosquitoes this year, especially in relation to bats. Uh, as you know, we've announced that we found white nose syndrome in Michigan uh, this winter. That's a disease of bats. It's a fungus that causes bats to die. Uh, and we've seen mortality, and we've picked it up in four counties now in the, U in the state, uh, three in the UP. It's pretty widespread, and we've seen pretty widespread mortality. Um, people are postulating whether the increase in mosquitoes is because of that. Um, right now, what we believe is happening with the mosquitoes is that we had, a, had an abnormally wet year, a lot of snow melt. Uh, a lot of water on the landscape, then we've had a rapid rise in temperatures, which leads to a, just a mushrooming mosquito population. Uh, at a localized level, certainly loss of bats from the ecosystem can have an impact on insect availability. The species of bats we have in Michigan, they're all insectivores, they eat lots of insects every night. Uh, they are the primary nighttime insect uh, predators out there on the landscape. Uh, so certainly if we lose populations of bats, we will over time see ec ecological impacts with increasing insect availability. Um, However, bats normally generally do not eat a lot of mosquitoes in their normal daily diet. 
If you think about mosquitoes, typically they're in the foliage. Uh, they're there until they're disturbed by an animal or a person walking through it. And then the mosquitoes come after that person or animal seeking a blood meal, uh, typically attracted to your body heat or the carbon monoxide that you give off. Um, bats typically feed at an airborne level. They're not feeding on the ground. They're not feeding in the foliage. They don't typically glean, what we call glean, or, or grab insects off the substrates. So mosquitoes typically are about 10% of their diet or less. Um, some bats eat more than others because they specialize in soft-bodied insects. But still, they can, uh, they can help us eliminate mosquitoes in some respects off the landscape. And certainly if you have bats that are by your yard and they're feeding on insects in the open, it can be a beneficial thing. Uh, reduce some of those things and it has helped us in the, in the past concerns about, uh, about diseases like uh, avian influenza, um, things of that nature where, where bats can be effective in, in mosquito control in some localized areas. One of the things we hear a lot about and people are inquiring about how um, white nose is going to impact our bat populations and the, the syndrome as it runs its course throughout the state of Michigan, what's happened in the 25 other states that have had this, we expect to see large declines in bat populations. Some species may decline by 90 percent or more. Um, and these are long-lived animals that live 25 plus years, have a very slow reproductive rate. So this will have impacts on the ecology in Michigan for a long period of time. Uh, what it means, you know, more precisely in the short term for, you know, mosquito populations, that we really can't speculate on. Um, but there's a lot of people who are aware now. They've seen a lot of the news about, you know, white nose syndrome, what it means for bats. And they're asking, what, what can they do? Um, right now, that's a struggle. The best thing they do is arm yourself with information. There's information available through the Fish and Wildlife Service and through the DNR about white nose, what it means, what it causes, um, and also how you can prevent the spread of it. The big thing is from avoid going into abandoned mines and caves and tracking the fungus around with your contaminated clothing and gear. Uh, that's probably the primary mechanism by which it spreads by human-aided assistance. Um, and the other big thing right now, people are asking about what can they do about mosquitoes? How can you control mosquitoes? Um, you know, one of the things we always tell people to do is if you have standing water on your property that's caused by old abandoned tires or equipment or pools, or something that causes water to pool, uh, you can eliminate those pools. That's the biggest thing is drain those kind of things so you're not having standing water. Even a flower pot can be a source of mosquitoes on the, on the back porch. So those things are that people can easily do to help control local populations of mosquitoes. That's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed watching and we'll see you again next week right here on Discovering.